Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk today about um, Frankel's conjecture. Um, I guess just a little bit about myself. So, I did my PhD in combinatorics. Uh, I graduated at Rutgers in 2015 and transitioned to machine learning, actually. So, I'm now a researcher in machine learning at Google. I spend the majority of my day thinking about how to train neural networks slightly faster. Uh, well, hopefully more really faster, but, uh, but uh, yeah, but for the past, like, I mean, really since 2015, I, I hadn't done any math research. I, I thought I was done. And uh, so you might wonder, well, why am I here talking about the enclosed conjecture? Um, so the story is that uh, October last year, I was in New York for a wedding um, and decided to drive down to Rutgers to meet my PhD advisor, Mike Sachs. And Mike and I had lunch. Uh, didn't talk about math or anything. He was telling me about his textbook. And after lunch, I decided to take a walk around, Ruck around Rutgers. I had some time to kill. And on this walk, I was just remembering my time in grad school. And this problem popped in my head. And, and I think if there were one problem that would pop in my head, it would be this one. Uh, this is such a wonderful problem to think about. It was definitely my favorite problem in, in grad school. And um, you know, but despite the fact that I spent months in grad school thinking about it, made no progress, somehow on this hour long walk, I, I saw the problem differently, uh, which is, it's honestly hard to explain, but uh, in this talk, I'd like to just share with you, you know, what went on in my mind on this walk and the, the weeks after, uh, but, um, okay, so I should introduce the problem. Um, so, so when you're talking about union closed families, uh, so, and so we have a, just a collection of um, subsets of the integers one to n, and our only assumption is that you know for every pair of sets in our collection, uh, if I take their union, I get another set in, in the collection. So it's a very minimal assumption that you can make, and um, you know so the conjecture from Peter Frankel in 1979 is that for any such union closed family, uh, with the one exception of the family that uh, contains just the empty set. Um, but um, other than this exception, that there always exists an element i, which is in contained at least half of the sets in f. Um, and in this talk, uh, we'll be thinking probabilistically. So we'll imagine we're sampling a random set in our family, and we're going to compute. You know, so we'd like to show that there exists an i where if we sample a set uniformly in our family, that the probability that i is contained in a is at least a half. Um, and yeah, so please, uh, if you have questions, please let me know. Uh, I mean, to be honest, this is the first time I'm using chalk in probably seven years. Uh, so <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, so today we'll, we'll prove a theorem uh, that, so we won't prove Frankel's conjecture, uh, but we'll show a constant lower bound. So we'll prove that there exists a constant C such that um, for any union closed family F, uh, that uh, the probability that if I sample A ran uniformly from F, the probability that I is contained in A is at least C. So I'll use this to call, like, I guess, the abundance of the element I. So we like to show that there's um, some element that uh, has abundance at least C. Um, okay, uh, and it's a little bit of history of the problem. I uh, So at least as I understand it, uh, you know, Frankel made this conjecture in 1979, and it sounds like it immediately went viral. Like, uh, it's such an elegant problem that within a few years, like, if you were working in common torques, you'd probably heard of it. But uh, it sounds like people at the time weren't sure where the conjecture originated from, and uh, which was unfortunate for Peter Frankel. Um, but, you know, so, so it took some time for the community to realize that it was Peter Frankel. He was a young mathematician at the time when he made the conjecture. Uh, anyway. Uh, As you think in probabilistically, is, uh, can one hope something similar for other probability distributions? Uh, yes or no? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so can one hope for something similar for other probability distribution? Oh, for other probability distributions. Uh, maybe. Um, so I'll, I'll discuss in a bit. I mean, actually, a natural attack on this problem is to try to construct a probability distribution uh, for which you can 
if you average over that distribution, the average abundance is, is at least um, some constant. Uh, so I'll, I'll discuss that a bit. Uh, hey, but let me give some examples. Uh, so. Okay, so uh, probably the easy example is just to take all subsets of, of n. So there are two to the n subsets. And uh, so this, I mean, family is clearly union closed. Um, I'll also use this like diagram to denote uh, the Boolean cube. So this, these are all subsets of two to the n. And this is the empty set down here. Then you have like the set to size one, the set to size two. These are sets of size n over two. Um, but yeah, so if you take all such subsets, I mean, this is clearly union closed. We have all, all sets. Um, and the abundance of each element is actually exactly a half in this case. Um, and uh, you know, so the hypothesis is that this is an extreme little construction. Um, and uh, yeah, OK, so for example, Another example, uh, so we can take F to be all sets A such that size of A is at least some integer K. So in this diagram, the cube at the layer, all sets of size is K, and we're going to take everything above it. And so this is still union closed because if I take the union of any two sets, I just walk up in the cube. And um, all we did was we chopped off, we removed like the, the small sets in our family. So the abundance is only going to grow. Um, so this still satisfies the conjecture. So I can ask? Yes. Um, is it uh, true? Is this conjecture true in the weaker form if you take not one element, but two elements or any other thing? Or is it obviously false? Like our, right, I think there are, I, I believe there are constructions that, maybe someone can correct me, but I, I believe there are constructions that show that the, you can't, you can't get like a constant number of elements that are uh, abundant or, but. Even two. <laughs> because I'm not sure actually. I'll, I'll tell you why I'm asking. Yeah. Because to me, uh, having abundance of one half Looks like it has nothing to do with the closedness with respect to union. Right, so right, you right. One, why don't you have two or three? Of that? Right, right. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, to be honest, I, I, uh, I I'm not sure. I, I, there's a lot of literature on this problem, and I, I don't actually know all the literature. So, um, I, I don't know of a counterexample for um, for like three elements, at least off the top of my head. But it, it, maybe it exists. Um, even, even like two. Yeah. I mean, maybe like just we consider very small size families that. Uh, but small size families, I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm allowing C to be as small as you want. Yeah. Um, I mean, so most of my intuition has been built on like sort of asymptotic construction. So I, I, I actually haven't played around too much with like small size families, um, but it's, it's a good question. I, I do actually have one like um, I don't think this will be a counterexample to your uh, well this will, okay uh, actually this this might answer part of your question uh, three. so we're gonna have four sets in our family uh, so let's see so f is going to be you know, the set one two we'll have the set one three. Then we'll have the set one, two, three. Then we have the set um, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then just throw a ton of numbers in here, maybe like all the way up to like a billion or something. Um, and so, yeah, uh, so this is still union closed. Um, it still satisfies the, you know, the conjecture. So the elements like the element one, for example, is contained in every set. Um, you know, but this is a this is an illustrative example because I think it shows some of the difficulty with attacking this problem, which is that you know it's really hard to you know we're trying to find the special element i that is abundant, but 
it's really hard to figure out what is special about this element. You know, the, our, our sets might have many useless elements and it's really hard to distinguish the special ones from the, the non-special ones. And I mean, just looking at this example, it's, you know, it's only, like, the only thing special about the element one is that it's contained in all sets, but that's what we're trying to show. So, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so, um, you know, so like at, at least in grad school, when I was thinking about this problem, I think my favorite line of attack was averaging arguments. So I'll, I'll give a sort of a sense of what that, you know, what such an argument might look like. So, um, you know, so instead of trying to prove there exists an I, that's kind of, it's hard to imagine how you find such an I, you know, maybe you try to construct a distribution, like, you know, we're gonna sample I according to some distribution, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so we'll define some distribution for sampling our element i, and we're going to compute this expectation i of uh, the abundance of i. F. Yeah, so maybe we want to show that this is bigger than some constant c. And so here we're still sampling a uniformly, but i might satisfy some uh, weird distribution. And you know, so this example shows that at least if we sample i uniformly at random, uh, we can't hope to conclude this uh, because basically most elements i are, uh, in this case, um, you know, less than a. In this case, there is only one set that, that contains it. Uh, so, and this, I guess this construction shows that like C bigger than a half um, doesn't work, but you can actually, I mean, you could make this be the power set of say, you know, all the integers K and then tack on some giant set to, to show that, you know, give a construction where this is little O of one. Um, and, uh, Let's see, so that's, that's one averaging argument that, that doesn't work. Um, another averaging argument you might consider is, uh, so to sample i, we'll first, so we'll first choose, we'll first sample some b uh, uniformly from our family, and then we'll choose um, some element i uniformly in b, and then we'll compute the, the abundance of this i. Uh, so another way to write this is expectation over a b size of a intersect b over size of b. Um, and so this is another way to define some distribution and you know maybe um, sampling I according to this process, uh, you know, maybe you could show that uh, I on average is abundant, um, but this also doesn't work. Uh, I won't give the construction yet, but um, there's a construction from Ellis, David Ellis. Uh, uh, I think it's 2020, but uh, he constructs a union closed family F for which this quantity is little over one. Uh, so you have this quantity here is, uh, um, and this was what it was like to work on this problem. You know, you would, you could really do this infinite loop. You would, you would pitch like an averaging argument. You would try to define some distribution. You would come up with a counterexample, and then you try to learn from that counterexample, and you would pitch the next, next uh, strengthening, and that would always turn out to be false. And so, I mean, some people would joke that maybe the conjecture about the union closed conjecture is that uh, every natural strengthening of the conjecture is false. And the stronger version of that conjecture is that Jeff Kahn has a counterexample to every natural strengthening of the union closed conjecture. <laughs> At least that was the sentiment that Rutgers anyway. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, but this is what made the problem so attractive. It was very open-ended. You could imagine averaging arguments. You could imagine proofs by induction. Uh, a lot of people would play with like set system constructions, try to massage the set to look differently, uh, to look nicer. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so as I said, the, the, the insight that I had on this walk was to consider the, the contrapositive. So let's write what the contrapositive is. So before you yeah. write the contrapositive, uh, do you know what's the uh, best, positive, uh, best possible previous 
a lower bound? Yeah, uh, it's, I think it's from um, Mill and Wojcik, if I get the names right, but the, yeah, they show that there exists an I, which is in, you know, at least omega, like one over, I think it's like log of size of F. Yeah, so this was the previous best known lower bound. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so let's, okay, so let's write the contrapositive. Um, okay, so yeah, so we're going to assume, yeah, so, so we're going to fix some C no bigger than zero. We're going to assume family F, which satisfies you know, for all elements I, the abundance of I. Is less than C. Uh, so this is our assumption. We can take C to be a very small constant, like one over a billion. And then, you know, we'd like to, from this, show that uh, F is not meaning closed. And I guess I should tack on the, I always, for, always forget the uh, special case of this. But, um, okay, so, I mean, it doesn't look like much. Uh, and I mean, even now I'm, Kind of scratching my head why I never considered the contrapositive in grad school. Uh, and the conclusion I came to is that it's kind of ugly. It, it's hard to imagine a proof that ends and therefore F is not union closed. Um, but I don't, I mean, on this walk, I just, I wasn't trying to prove it. I was just trying to like play with it. And so I was happy to just consider, let me just consider a random family F that, with, not literally, but just any family F that just has all the elements are very sparse. Um, so here's the, the first observation. So, okay, we can actually take a more extreme case. Like, uh, let's assume, let's assume for all i that the abundance uh, that this is at most one over size of f. So this is the sort of most extreme case. Um, this is another way of just writing that every element is contained in at most one set in, in my family. Um, so to give an example of such a family, so maybe the set one, two, maybe the set three, set four, five, set six, seven. Um, so, you know, th this, this assumption implies that all my steps are pairwise disjoint. And so it's very clearly not union closed, but I mean, the observation was that if I consider this construction, so I'm going to take CF, F, I'm going to take all pairwise unions in this family. So that's all A union B. Uh, with uh, you know, a B. So, with observation is that for in this extreme case, if I consider all pairwise unions, that I actually get a lot of sets. I right? get way more sets than I started with. Uh, in fact, in this case, we'll get um, you know, size of F choose two sets in our in this in this construction which is of course way bigger than the size of f uh, so so not only is f not union closed but um, when i take all pairwise unions i get quadratically more sets than i started with okay so that was that was one observation Okay, so I considered another example. So suppose F is all sets A with size of A 
times at most, um, some C times N. All right, so we're going to take the Boolean cube again, and we're going to take some small C, and we're just going to like take all the sets down here. This is a uh, size of A, C times N. And so if, if we start with this set and we take all pairwise unions, uh, we're going to get uh, this set up here, or basically everything that's below here. So all these, we'll basically get all sets um, of size, you know, at most 2CN. Right? And, and so if C is quite small, like tending to zero, this, this again is something like quadratically many sets uh, relative to the size of F. Um, and so, so that was that was sort of the conjecture I had on this walk was that uh, let's see. So the conjecture I had was um, actually let me write it over here. In fact, I guess this is now zero, but uh, the time is. In conjecture. So there exists a C bigger than zero, some other constant D bigger than one, uh, such that, you know, so if F, we have a family, and uh, this family satisfies. Uh, this family satisfies, so you have the max abundance. Uh, for all i, then uh, size of f union f. So that was the, yeah, so that's where I got to on my walk. And uh, I mean, I didn't really think much of it at the time. I, I, I was planning to just go back to, <laughs> to Google and start doing machine learning research again. Uh, and I, I, I assumed this was false. I just, I, it didn't occur to me that like, it was such a simple observation. Um, and I mean, honestly, I, I think I would have just dropped it, but uh, I, I checked the polymath project on the problem. So in 2016, there was a polymath project on Tim Gower's blog, and a sizable group of mathematicians got together and to attack this question. And yeah, you, know, you can, I mean, it's it's actually fun to go back and read it. Uh, you know, you see lots of like averaging arguments, you see lots of proofs by induction. And I mean, I had to literally, you know, do control F on the polymath project, searching for the word contrapositive, because I, I was hoping that someone had a counterexample to this, because I, I couldn't come up with a counterexample. And I just I kind of wanted to get it out of my mind, right? <laughs> uh, but you know, the first day, there's 100 comments, no mention of counter, uh, contrapositive. And second day, 100 comments, no mention. And third day, still no mention. And I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, I was, it was really quite surprising to me. Uh, and I, I think I'm not alone, like having talked to a number of people spend a lot of time on this problem that it is quite surprising that no one conjectured this before. <laughs> Cause I think this was kind of hiding in plain sight. Uh, and um, but yeah, I, I think one thing I just wanted to mention is I, that I think the polymath project had a lot of value, you know, even though they, they they didn't make much progress on the problem, but just seeing all the like attempts just, you know, written out, I could actually, you know, verify for myself that this actually was new. And, you know, cause I mean, the, the one thought in your mind when you're working on a problem like this is that like, surely every thought I have, someone's walked this path before. And that thought is especially strong when your insight into the problem is to think about the contrapositive. So, um, Can I ask you? yeah. Uh, do you use this notation uh, disjoint union potentially or, or not? Uh, because uh, from what I understand, you're not oh. using that, uh, disjoint, right? Oh, right, this is disjoint union. So you have to forgive me. I I really haven't been uh, reading math papers for a long time. So I, I just wanted to, 
I just want to distinguish this is not the normal union operation, but uh, this, is, this is all pairwise unions, but it doesn't mean disjoint union. I think maybe I could use like a plus or something. I don't know. And then, to be honest, I don't understand what it means, but oh, yeah, why is it not the usual union? Oh, so it's the family of union of two sets. In the uh, yeah, so in, in this A union B for A and B. Yeah, for example, right, so this is the definition here. Uh, maybe I can use the plus. Um, so it's all pairs A union B. Um, so for in this case, you have to take like, you know, be the set one, two, three, and then I take these two, one, two, four, oh, five. Okay. And, yeah, so that's why I get, in the case where they're all pairwise disjoint, that's why I get, yes. you know, size F. Yeah, yeah that, that I figured out, but, uh, um, that made sense then. But, okay. Yeah. No, yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, and by the way, I presume that you mean that the cardinality of F to the power G, not uh, the, the cardinality is inside F. Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so yeah, uh, and I, one of the things that at least I liked about this way of thinking about the problem um, is, so I mean, if, if you imagine trying to prove the normal direction, um, you know, so we can imagine a proof of the normal direction that starts like, this is some supposed proof, you know, and we start with like, you know, let us be closed. And you know, we, let's take some A that's an F. And let's consider the set and F of A, which is all sets A union B to B and F. Right, uh, this is a natural start of a proof. Uh, I think I've, I mean, if you, when you're trying to work in this problem, you've, you've probably have considered many constructions like this. Uh, there's not really much else you can do. Um, you know, but if a problem with this proof is that uh, we've barely made use of the union closed assumption. So the, here where we're only touching like size of F unions, like size of F pairs, A and B, Right, but the, you know, there's quadratically many such pairs that I could consider, and so I, I, I sort of like this that you know it's sort of in, baked into the assumption I, I'm considering all all uh, all pairs A and B, um, and uh, yeah, so I, I was so, somewhat optimistic that maybe this gets around some of the issues that uh, made this problem difficult. Okay, uh, but you know, I think I. I don't know if I mentioned in the beginning, but the, you know, the, to prove this theorem, we ended up needing to use um, entropy. And so it took me some time to get from here to entropy. Uh, so let me try to trace what, like at least my thought uh, that, that got me there. Um, okay. Uh, do you have a question or? Um, So, um, so we have this conjecture, uh, but I, I really it was really unclear how to use this assumption uh, that you know every element i is sort of not contained in many sets. Um, so, um, but the the intuition was that you know we have size f choose choose two pairs here that somehow we can't like cram so like somehow we can't map so many pairs into very few sets without like reusing many elements. Uh, so that was the intuition. And so I tried a different conjecture. Uh, so this conjecture two, uh, which turned out to be false, but uh, refuting it was really the, um, was really at least informative for me. Um, so conjecture two is that there exists some C bigger than zero, D bigger than one, such that we're gonna suppose that F satisfies C 
consider this quantity again. Expectation for A and B. So I said, Size of A. Suppose that this is less than C. And so then we'd like to show that this implies that again the, the number of unions we get, pairwise unions, uh, is bigger than. Okay. So I guess this is a you know weaker assumption. I mean, this if we assume that every element's in at most some C factor in the sets, then this would imply that the average size, if I choose two sets A and B in my family and I consider the size of their intersection, uh, that on average, that, that size is small. So the, the picture here is I choose, I choose A and B at random that they kind of look like this. Um, that at least their intersection here Sort of in expectation, they, they intersect in relatively few elements. Um, okay, but this turned out to be false. Uh, so let me describe the, as you, before that, um, yeah, but I, I thought maybe this captured the intuition that uh, maybe this is enough to force that the, that the number of unions grows. Um, you know, if you imagine like, okay, I choose A randomly, I choose B randomly, it can't intersect with many sets of A. Maybe I choose some C and maybe it looks like this. Then some D, maybe it looks like this. And if this were the picture, then you know, when I take all pairwise unions that uh, you know, I might get like quadratically many sets. But, uh, but let me show a construction that sort of refutes this. Sorry, uh, yeah. did I understand correctly Do you say that uh, conjecture two implies conjecture one as a pretty equal case? Or conjecture one implies conjecture two, but conjecture two it is false, but conjecture one is true. So, so uh, then uh, conjecture one cannot apply conjecture two. Uh, if it's true and uh, then it's probably the other way. Two implies one. I mean, two implies one, sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the assumptions yeah. of, uh, from what I understood, the assumptions of conjecture one imply the assumption of conjecture. Yes, good, that, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, good. Um, right, right, yeah, yeah, okay, uh, exactly. Um, anyway, so but let's let's come up with a counterexample to this. Yes. So I mean, it's like, I'm also confused about the counterpositive, but then yeah, the, you said at least some kind of gave a counterexample to this. Um, yeah, good. So uh, when I was working on it, I, I wasn't aware of Ellis's construction. So I, uh, so I'll, but my construction is similar to what Ellis did. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, okay, so our family is going to look somewhat. A little bit complicated, but let's see. So my universe of elements, I'm going to start with some x1 union. Yes, these are disjoint unions. So that, that's the notation for a disjoint union, right? Okay. Uh, x1, I'll call this c. Okay, so I, I start with, um, you know, a bunch of disjoint. So this is what the universe looks like. So uh, the size of each xi is going to be k. Um, and so I'm going to consider, I'm going to start with uh, the power set of each of these xi. So I'm going to have like all subsets of x1, of all subsets of x2, and finally I'll have all subsets of xc. Um, so I'm going to start with this, but my final family F is actually not going to contain these sets. I'm going to um, modify these sets uh, in the following way. So if I have some A, that's a subset of X1, I'm going to replace that with A union X2 union X3 all the way up to 
x sub c. And then I'm going to tack on some gigantic set b1. So b1 is going to, I'm going to add some elements to my universe. Uh, <laughs> okay, so what I've done is I've, I've taken a set here and I've sort of tacked on all the, um, you know, all these other sets. So x2, x, x3, and then so on. And I do this for each family. So if I have a subset of x2, I want to replace that with a union x1, a union x3, all the way up to this. And I'm going to tack on some other gigantic set, uh, b2. So I need to add another set here. If b1 is the same for every a and x1, I guess. Yes, b1 is the same for every a and x1. Good. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I tack on basically C such of these B sub I. So I have B1, B2, all the way up to B sub C. Uh, and the way to think about the sizes of these things is we let C be much smaller than K, which is going to be much smaller than the size of the BI. Okay. Uh, so, so I claim that this quantity here. Uh, so first, let's just verify that this quantity is, is small. Um, so, you know, so if, if I take a random pair A and B, you know, I'm very, like, C is going to tend to infinity. So uh, they're very unlikely to land in the same X1. So if I have, uh, let's uh, move over here. Let's see. Good. Uh, right. So if I if I take two sets at random, a and b, you know, they're they're only their intersection. I guess on average, their intersection, the you know, size of a intersect b, is going to be at most like two times k. Uh, yeah, the, the exceptions are where I choose both sets in the same x x i, but that happens with probably at most one over c. Um, but in expectation, like most pairs satisfy this, and the you know, size of a is going to be is going to be huge because of this um, gigantic set that I tacked on. Uh, so size of a is at least um, you know size of b one, and so this this is quite small, I and mean, this will be little one uh, because I'm letting b the size of the b sub i tend to be like much much larger than um, the size of k. So it's, a, it's not probably important, but then yeah, the, the intersection size might be like c times k because yeah, it's like x or x five. Oh, things. thank you. Yeah, uh, very good. Yeah, c c times k. Good. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, but I can let I can grow b sub i to to uh, account for that. Okay. Uh, so okay. So this quantity that I defined up here is going to be small for this family. Um, you know, but so let's think about what happens when I consider uh, consider all pairwise unions. And uh, so the observation is that if I take a in this guy and I take some v here, for any pair a and b, like they they map to the same set, right? Because uh, yeah, because A contains X2 and B contains X1. And so when I take their union, they, they, they collapse to a single set. And so sort of pictorially what that kind of looks like is, you know, if I take a set of A and B, an intersect here. If I take another C and D that's in the same, you know, family as A and same family as B, you know, they also kind of look like, you know, they're also going to intersect in very few elements, but, their unions are going to be exactly the same. So, uh, yeah, so I take, so yeah, all, all these, I have many such pairs and they, they all map to the same set. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, but so the reason why I was considering this, though, I was just trying to understand how are we supposed to use this assumption that the max abundance is small? And I thought that this, um, that this average pairwise intersection being small captured the intuition that I that I have many I have size f choose two pairs, 
they're trying to map these, cram these into just some linear number of sets. And it seemed like you couldn't do that, uh, at least if their typical intersection was small. And uh, I mean, <laughs> I guess it was here that just, I was asking myself, so what are the interesting elements of this family? And you know, of course there, there are the elements um, contained in all of these XI, the, the Bs are not interesting. But you know, what, what made them interesting is these are the elements that give the family entropy. Right? The reason why I have many sets at all is I need sets to disagree somewhere. And so those elements that you know, I have lots of disagreement are, are, what, are the reason why I have many sets. And that's what distinguished the, um, you know, the XIs from the Bs. And so I, uh, you know, so it's sort of informally, I was thinking like um, the interesting elements were the elements, you know, the, this is very informal, but and the elements I, which, you know, make, oh, quotes, uh, H of A, B. And maybe a way to quantify this a bit more is uh, if you imagine, um, so let's see, so, uh, so let's suppose let's suppose that we sample a random set F in, in our or sorry set A in our family here, um, and we're going to I'm going to use the natural correspondence of you know so I have some subset of integers and I'm going to I'm just going to have the correspondence that uh, between the binary string of length n where um, if I have a set here. I just have the binary string where I have a one if the element i is in my set. And yeah, you know, so I want to I want to talk about this construction. So it's just a less than i is going to be all the the first i i minus one bits. Okay. So it's a one, a two up to i minus one. And I guess what the intuition was at the time was that, um, you know, so I sort of imagined this graph where I have um, the x-axis is going to be the, you know, the, uh, the integers, the integers in my universe, maybe the first couple are, are the integers corresponding to x1, and then the next are b1, the next integers are x2, and so on. Now on the y-axis, I was imagining, uh, you know, the entropy of the first i bits, where right? I sample a randomly. I was just imagining what does this graph look like. So you can think of it as like I'm going to choose a random set here, and I'm going to encode it to you as a binary string, and I'm going to you know send each bit one at a time, and we're just going to ask you know, how much information do you learn about the set a as I communicate this to you bit by bit. And um, so if I send you the first bit x1, maybe I learn a little bit. Uh, so the graph is going to look something like this, where you know, each element of xi is going to communicate roughly the same amount of information. I think maybe the first one, you learn, you learn a lot just from knowing that uh, like if x1, if the first bit of x1 is zero, you learn a lot because you learn that uh, my, my set A lives in here. But so yeah, maybe the first jump is bigger. Uh, yeah, but the, you know, the point is when I, when I get to B, I might still learn something from the first bit of B. Uh, the reasoning for that is maybe, maybe I sampled A is equal to x1. In which case, learning the first bit of B tells me that I sampled the, 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 the entire set X1. Um, but then, you know, but th that's it. Like, the, so the first B learns some information, and then it's just flat. And then once I start going to the bits X2, you know, the event that I sampled something in X2, I'll, I'll learn some information. And so it kind of just looks like this. Uh, at least that was the intuition. <laughs> um, and so, so, yeah, so that was sort of, I guess, the second Eureka moment, which was that this kind of solved the problem of, well, what are the interesting elements in my universe? They're the elements that give the, the family entropy. 
Um, and so that's what led me to the final conjecture, which we ended up proving. So, so now a theorem. So let's see, let A and B be maybe samples from the distribution. Um, subset of N. Okay, and we're going to assume also that H of A is bigger than zero. And we're going to assume that for all I probability that uh, I is at A is at most some constant C. So as there's some, you know, fix some C bigger than zero, or there exists a C with this property. So this is the assumption. And then the conclusion that we'd like to get to is that um, H of A minus B is strictly bigger than H of A. Okay. Um, so, excuse me, I guess I'm just, what do you mean by H of A? Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, I probably should have defined that. Um, so, all right. So here, uh, so this is, um, so we're considering the entropy of random variable. So, uh, so H of A, and so the, the definition is you're going to sum over, uh, I guess, all elements in the support. Um, so this is a random variable. So we're going to sum over all elements in the support of the random variable. And we're going to look at the probability of the element negative px log. PX. Um, so, so this is a measure of like how much uncertainty there is in the random variable. It depends on the size of a. It depends on the on the number of element of a. Oh, it's it's trying to entropy of the. Oh, oh, excuse me. Wait, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> Um, but you're not the first person to ask me that. So, <laughs> um, okay, but you know, maybe I can give uh, maybe I can give some examples that I think will help us understand this theorem statement. Uh, so, So example one, uh, so, so uh, we're gonna just let each AI is, um, you know, IID for Bernoulli. So they're just uh, independent coin flips uh, with probability, uh, I guess we're using C, so. Uh, uh, okay, um, and so, right, so what is the entropy, what is the entropy of A in this case? So, you know, I, I basically, I flip N coins, they each have probability P of being heads, and they're independent, and so the, you just, you sum the entropies. Uh, so I, H, A, I. And you know, the way to compute entropy of a single coin flip is if this is the you know, probability of heads. Um, so this is one, this is the probability of, um, of heads. Then, uh, you know, so C equals a half is the case where it's the most, the most uncertain. Uh, so, so yeah, so this is the sort of shape of or the plot of, of the function on a log 
negative log c times c. Right. Okay. Um, and yeah, so h of ai is going to be, yeah, just uh, so this is equal to n times little h of c. Uh, good. And then so, um, right, so then what is, I guess I should define, I mean, so each of our A union B here, we're sort of thinking about binary strings now. So when we take union, if I have a one in for A, and, you know, I'm basically doing the bitwise or now. Um, good. So what is H of A union B here? So, if I think about the, the distribution of the ith element here, you know, so I flip two coins, both the probability C of being heads, and they're independent. And so uh, I guess the probability that they're, well, at least one of them heads is going to be um, so the n times h of 2c minus c squared. Okay. And and so, uh, so we can figure out what's the best possible C here. Um, and so, uh, all right, so, so, so to do that, it's a simple calculation, but you know, there, there's, there's a special number here, which is like three minus square root five over, over two, where, um, right, so this is, I guess C equals this then 2c minus c squared, in this case, will be this guy, and it's the you know, perfect mirror. For like. So this is the number where um, the entropy of the union equals the entropy of a single coin flip. Um, and I uh, guess the way you get this is it, it's the, you know, you, it's the solution to the polynomial uh, c squared minus 3c, if I get this right, plus one. Zero. Okay, so that's where this magic number comes from, uh, and yeah. So I, uh, um, yeah. So I, I guess we now know uh, the union closed sets conjecture hold for this number. Uh, we actually were slightly above it now, um, but that's where that magic number comes from. Um, okay, uh, how much time do I have left? About five minutes. All right. Uh, yeah. So maybe um, maybe in the last five minutes, let me at least convince you that this theorem implies a constant lower bound for the union closed sets conjecture. Uh, so let's do. So we can call this. Yeah. So this theorem. Uh, do I still have it? Uh, maybe I erased the theorem. What what is it? This implies a constant going down. Okay. Uh, I think five, ten extra minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I'll. I'll briefly sh show how this relates to the union closed sets conjecture. And then uh, the proof of this is uh, it's not too bad it, modulo very technical uh, calculations that I personally did not do. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I'll, I'll give a sense of how to, how to prove this. Um, okay, uh, so suppose this theorem is true. We'd like to show that this says something interesting about Frankel's conjecture. Um, so suppose, Suppose we have some union closed F. And we're also going to assume that um, you know, the max abundance is at low C. Okay, uh, so now we're going to take the A, B. Are you know IID uniform samples from F? Okay, 
Um, so, so then this must hold H of A union B is at most H of A. And, and this is where we use the union closed assumption. Uh, so um, so I, I have a union closed family F. I take two random samples from it and I compute their union. And the, the point is this distribution is supported over the family F. And the max entropy distribution over any set is the uniform distribution. Um, but you know, this is a contradiction with, uh, with this theorem, which says that you know, under this assumption that the max abundance is the most C, then, then, uh, then the entropy must grow. So this is a contradiction. Um, uh, so I had some people tell me they read the paper and then they got to the end and they were like, where did you use the union closed assumption? Uh, but it's actually just buried in the introduction uh, with this. This is really the only time we used it. So, um, okay. Actually, uh, this diagram might be useful for me. Uh, let's see where I want to go. Yeah, I'll just reuse this board. Okay. Um, all right. So, so how how do we prove this theorem? Um, so it, it's going to proceed sort of like this, where we're going to we're going to sample A and B, you know, from this from this distribution. And this is more general. This is any distribution over um, subsets of N. But you now I'm going to reveal the bits of A and B, A and A union B to you one by one, and we're going to just calculate what happens to the entropy of each of these partial sets uh, as as I reveal the bits. Um, so. Let's do some ordering of the set with an element. Oh, say it again? So here you broke the breakdown symmetry by ordering the number one to n. Yeah, uh, yeah, good. So yeah, we, we need to fix some ordering uh, and we're going to reveal the bits uh, one by one. Yeah, good. Um, so. Okay, so we're going to write you know, H of A. So we can use the chain rule of entropy. H of A I given A S to I. Right, and so I guess the quantity here is just going to measure like how much does, does the entropy jump when I'm re revealing one by one. Um, and now we're going to look at each of A and B. All right, so, um, so, what, so what we'd like to show is that at each step, I guess a term here is bigger than or equal to a term here. Right? And you know, the, the first bit we reveal is, is, is easy to show that the, the, that the entropy grows because you know, that's basically uh, this picture here where you know, we, for the first bit, there's no conditioning, there's just two coin flips. And you know, here we, we showed that if the, you know, max abundance is less than this number, then the entropy of A union B is strictly bigger than entropy of A. So the, the first term in this sum is going to be bigger than the first term in this. Um, but, you know, so, but the challenge here is dealing with the conditioning, of course. Um, okay, but the first observation, and I mean, this took me a long time actually to figure out. Uh, it, I mean, it's weird to have, you think for a month and then like it becomes one line in your proof of <laughs> uh, but anyway so but the at least the key step for me was to realize that um, so this term here 
h of a union b to i condition on its history that this is bigger than or equal to h of a union b to i conditioned on the history of a and the history of b. Okay. Uh, so this follows from the data processing inequality. Uh, intuitively, um, if I tell you this, if I tell you the history of A and the history of B, you can compute the history of the union. And so here I'm telling you strictly more information. And so if I condition on strictly less information or less than, you know, yeah, then this inequality holds in, in the case that, you know, this has more information. Um, and this was nicer to work with. Uh, Okay, so um, so to prove our theorem now, it's enough to show that this each of these terms is bigger than or equal to each of these terms. So we'd like to show that um, h of a and b i conditioned on history. So I, I guess what we what we now know is that this is bigger than or equal to um, h of 2c minus c squared over h of c times, um, make sure I have this right. Yeah, good. Um, so I, I always confuse myself because, uh, you know, condition on this history, there might be no entropy here. Uh, so I always have to check that, you know, this term might be, both these terms might be zero, um, but that, that's okay. Uh, uh, but, you know, but the point is that at least for the, you know, for the interesting elements in our family, when there's entropy here, that the entropy of the union still needs to grow, even under the conditioning. Uh, so that, that's, we'd like to show this. Um, and you know, in fact, this this inequality holds. Um, and so I'll just I'll say a few words about uh, you know this this basically the proof involves just write down the mathematical expression for this. It's a double expectation. It's kind of a mess. Um, and uh, it, I mean, it, it turns out to be a, a, an analysis question that it, it kind of looks like Jensen, like Jensen's inequality should solve it, but it, it's a non-convex optimization problem. Um, but let me at least write what that optimization problem is. Uh, right, so I mean, another way to write this quantity is that, um, so, you know, let me just, each of A condition on its history, you know, the way you can, you can think about it is you sample a history, and then I have some coin flip that's conditioned on what that history is. And so if I have, say, like, I don't know, let's say I have a million possible histories, there's a million possible coin flips. And, um, you know, this, this quantity here is, you know, so I, I just I have some, let's see. I have some history of, uh, I have some set of numbers, uh, P, call this like uh, P sub I, P sub X. X in all possible histories. So this is just a sequence of real numbers, uh, of numbers between zero and one. Right? Uh, so for each possible history, I have some number between zero and one that indicates the probability that that I get had sampled on that history. Uh, and so my assumptions are that you know, the expectation of P sub X is less than, less than equal to our, our constant C here. Um, okay, and I'll, yeah. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so what we'd like to show is that, so if I do expectation over some X, and x prime. These are two independent histories. Uh, and so if we translate what this conditional, what, what this guy here looks like, it's 
you know, it's basically little h of p sub x plus p sub x prime minus p sub x times p sub x prime. And we like to show this is bigger than or equal to this magic number, h of 2 c squared over h of c times uh, yeah, over x of h of p of x. Um, OK, so it's, I mean, it, it's this double expectation. and. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess the, the intuition that at least as far as I got is I basically did a lot of plots in Mathematica and, and convinced myself that uh, really the sort of extremal case was um, either like there's only like one or two numbers here that, that, are, that our public distribution is supported over either one or two points. And, um, you know, in the case that's supported by just one point, that's basically the independent case. Um, because you know, if if the, the distribution of A is independent of the history, then you know there's only one such possible uh, number that matters. Um, and uh, you know, but I, I mean, to be honest, I, I hadn't done real analysis in like six years, so I, I I sort of like threw my hands up in the air and I just did the easiest bound I could, uh, and I mean, kind of take like two more minutes or okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just, I'll sort of sketch the, the argument I gave, um, you know, but there was you know, a lot of follow-up work. I mean, I uploaded my paper uh, like November 16th and within four days, there were like four independent proofs of this. Uh, so, so that was, that was fun to watch. I, I, I mean, I was joking with my fiance. I was like, I, I can't tell if I'm stuck on like some like first year homework problem or if this is actually hard. <laughs> Uh, and I, I guess it wasn't too hard because uh, oh, a lot of people uh, did it. But it, it was really fun to, to like see all the follow-up work. Um, okay, uh, but at, at least as far as I got with it, um, you know, so I just sort of considered this um, square here. So this is, you know, zero, one. So this is sort of, uh, yes, yeah, so I guess if we think the history, possible histories of A, you know, so I, I just have a bunch of um, you know, numbers here. You know, maybe this is like PX1, this is some PX2, and so on. Uh, but all I know is that I just have a bunch of numbers here, and their, their average, their mean is something like you know, this 3 minus root 5 over 2. And then I, I have the same set of numbers here. Um, and yeah, I guess the, the point is that um, you know, in this double expectation, there's sort of, you can decompose it into a couple of different terms. So I just, you know, I, I sort of, I, I didn't get this strong of a bound. So I, I did like, you know, 1%. So I'm sort of assuming that like most of them are kind of concentrated down here. And, uh, and the main observation is that, at least in this region, uh, this term is significantly bigger than the, uh, the single expectation term. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, let's see. And then, and then I, uh, yeah, I, start, I decompose it into three parts. So there's, there's this term. And then there's the sum of these two guys. And there's this final one that we throw away. Um, but, but yeah, I guess the, the main observation was that this guy is bigger than or equal to um, uh, sorry, I did not prepare this part of the talk, but um, I don't know, maybe I should stop here before I <laughs> uh, ho hopefully it, you, I gave at least some intuition for why this this bound holds uh, yeah just th this function it's significantly bigger than the 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 right hand side at least in this region and um, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll stop here uh, so. more questions Great. 
You don't think there are ways of enumerate one to n, which are better than some other ways? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, uh, it, right. It's possible that maybe there's uh, better enumerations. Uh, it, I think it's just hard to. I mean, there, we're not placing any assumptions over the family F, so it's hard to figure out. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, uh, that's certainly possible. Um, so then, uh, do any of the follow will work on uh, break? It's like your bottom C. Yeah, good, good. Uh, so yeah, there was, uh, so Will Sawin um, proposed a, a slight modification where instead of sampling A and B uniformly at random, we're going to sample A, B, and then some set C that's coupled with uh, with A. And uh, and if you, if you try to do the the analysis on that um, coupling, you you get slightly past the, you get some epsilon fraction. And so, yeah, maybe I can mention some of the fault works. Uh, so. Uh, Yeah, so I mean, on, right, so I uploaded on November 16th, you know, we had, uh, we had C equals 0 0.01. And then on November 20th, 21st, uh, we had, so there are four groups that did C equals B minus root five over two. So there was, um, I guess, uh, Brian always here at Princeton, uh, uh, Huang and, and Selk. And then there was also Chase and Lovett and Will Sawin. And um, as the fourth person was uh, Peabody or Peabody. I have bad with names. But anyway, so we have four groups do this. And, and Will Sawin, uh, Will Sawin sketched an argument which did uh, three minus root five over two plus some epsilon. But he, he didn't quantify what epsilon is. And so um, let's see. So December first, uh, you. I mean, this is like really fast, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, so you did. Um, so he got point three eight two three four, and this is something like point three eight one. Sorry, <laughs> three eight one nine. So yeah, we, we inched up. And then um, December 23rd, so it can be, uh, so it can be tacked on some additional decimal points. So we did 0 0.382345. Three, uh, and uh, I think he also is it with some other like none. Uh, uh, so I think there's a lot of computer calculations went into these arguments, uh, at least from my understanding. I, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I, I, I haven't had time to really digest all the whole work. So, um, but my understanding of where we are now is that I think can, can be argues that at least this construction that Solomon proposed of we do A, B, and then C coupled, that, that this is the limit of at least that argument. Um, but you know, there's, I think there's still a lot to explore. I mean, this uh, maybe sample C a bit more cleverly somehow that you can uh, improve it. I mean, I think, um, you know, a sort of related question is like, um, you know, suppose I just give you a collection of subsets, just a very sparse collection. And I just ask you to lower bound the size of F union F. So the, the entropy bound where like, we'll tell you that, um, you know, so in this case, if I give you all sets where their size is at most some epsilon N, you, know, you can give like the entropy bound gives you basically the size of this family, which is all sets of size, um, you know, two epsilon minus epsilon squared. And this is what the entropy lower bound will give you. But you know, if you if you take literally all such sets down here, you actually get slightly more 
you, know, you get you get all the stuff here, which is the two epsilon. And you know, no one. I don't think. Any, yeah, if you could figure out how to how to push past this slower bound, I think it's essentially the same problem as closing the gap for the union close. That's conjecture, which is, um, and you know, it's it, at least here. You know, if you sample A and B, like one way to do it is you sample A and then you sample B just joint from A, and that will give you A union B lives up here. You know, so maybe there's like some some way to sample B like that is you want it to be like really as just just joint as possible from A. At least that's I think my current intuition on the problem. But um, yeah, I wonder if. Um... The same statement holds under the weaker assumption that two elements, uh, uh, you know, for every i and j, uh, uh, the probability of i and j simultaneously is an x ah. small equivalency. Then you can do uh, if if this holds with under the weaker assumption, then I presume uh, you will be able to do uh, the two elements. Yeah, uh, I think it's um, yeah. That's an interesting question. I, I haven't thought about it too much. Uh, I mean, it sounds to me very considerable. Yeah. yeah. And if you can do two, then. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a big analysis problem, but you can just check if you can improve the yeah. C, right? Yeah. 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 Cool. Uh, so that's my talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.